think should we start? Okay. Well, welcome. Um, nice to see you all. I'm Barbara Quintiliano, and uh, you'll be getting handouts that'll have my name and, and my, um, uh, my phone number on it, my, my campus number, so don't worry about how to spell my name. You'll we'll see what it looks like. And I'm one of the research and um, construction librarians at Fountain Library. And I'm Louisa Siwinski. I work at the library also as the Access Services Team Leader. And that's basically all of our public services, the desk, the front desk that you might see when you first walk into the library. And uh, I've been doing that for about 25 years. So um, the title of, of our presentation today, I probably shouldn't move it? too far from the mic. I'm, I'm, I'm straying too far from the mic here, but I, I tend to walk around a lot. Hi, right, come on in. I'll, I'll wait a second until everybody gets, right. Hello. gets a seat. Maybe we'll introduce ourselves again. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was saying, I'm Barbara Quintiliano, and don't worry if you got to take notes about who the speaker was. I'm, I have handouts that have my name on it, so you don't have to worry. I'm not going to spell it out. You'll be able to see it. And I'm one of the research and uh, instruction librarians at Valley Library. So. Feel free to stop in if you have research needs, whether it's uh, about U.S. foreign policy or anything else. Um, I'd be glad to, to give you a hand. You, you now know a personal librarian, librarian personally, and my colleague, Louisa Siwinski, again, um, the team leader of Access Services, which is most of the public services on the first floor. Feel free to ask me any questions in the future as well. So um, the title of our presentation today, or a little we're going to try and make it a little bit interactive too. Um, is called uh, "Reckoning with Torture," and uh, you'll see where we got the title from that in a little while. Um, on each of the slides of our PowerPoint, um, this picture is there. It's grayed out. This is one of the Abu Ghraib paintings. Um, this was done by a Colombian artist whose name is Fernando Botero. And he is known for his kind of, his style, his particular style is to, to paint people that are kind of balloon-like. And um, you've probably seen uh, paintings and drawings of his and you know, maybe not, not even realized it. But when the Abu Ghraib photos were released in 2004, it really, really affected him. And he was moved to um, do a series of paintings and drawings. And I picked this one, um, which is actually based on everything that he drew and <coughs> he looked at a photo that came out of Abu Ghraib and then kind of did an interpretation. And what I like about his paintings is, if you actually look at the Abu Ghraib photos, after someone has been tortured for so long and really abused, they, their affect, their, their ability to express emotion really kind of suffers. You really don't see too much on their face. But Botero gives them, shows them expressing emotion. So he kind of gives them their humanity back. They're no longer just bodies being, um, being subjected to what's going on. So, um, and you can, you can see his paintings on the web. Um, and there's also this book. This happens to be my book, but I'm going to give you um, a list of resources at the end. And uh, you could probably get this book, if not at our library, you can check at another library you know, or order it. You could also borrow it from me. Just contact me. I'll be glad to lend it to you. So our title, um, uh, Reckoning with Torture, actually comes from a whole um, collection of uh, documents which was put together by the ACLU, okay, the um, American Civil Liberties Union. And what we're going to be using today comes from various humanitarian organizations, the ACLU, you're going to hear about Amnesty, you're going to hear about an organization called the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. Um, else? Oh, Physicians for Human Rights is another one. So um, that's where we got our reckoning, uh, reckoning with Torture title. 
Uh, before the September 11th attack, the United States condemned torture, protested secret tribunals, decried disappearances, and challenged secret and arbitrary detentions. But a growing public record of official documents and testimonies makes it undeniably clear that prisoners were tortured, abused, and in some cases even killed in U.S. custody since 911, 9-11 and that officials at the very highest levels of our government authorized and encouraged the mistreatment. And although the Obama administration has taken important steps toward ending these abuses, the world is watching to see whether the United States' stated commitment to human rights and the rule of law extends to investigating and prosecuting its own post 9-11 abuses. It is essential for our security and for our standing in the world that we condemn these violations of the Constitution and of domestic and international law, and that we hold accountable those who authorize the abuse and torture of prisoners in America's name. The United States has some reckoning to do, and we invite you to start with the evidence we'll present today. So we're gonna read an excerpt now. Um, I'm going to be reading the part, of, I'm going to be reading excerpts from a legal memo that was signed by um, Assistant Attorney General Jay Bybee, uh, whose picture is right there. Right now, Jay Bybee, who started, at the time uh, this was written, he was part, he was a, you, uh, he was a White House legal counsel attorney. Right now, um, he is uh, judge of the Court of Appeals uh, for the Ninth District Court. He has moved on. Um, also, um, a lot of input into this document. Um, John Yu had a lot of input into this document, and he is currently teaching law at UCLA Berkeley. Um, this August 1st, 2002 memo, so it dates from August 1st, 2002, it addresses proposed interrogation techniques for a detainee named Abu Zubaydah. And I will be reading excerpts of Abu Zubaydah's firsthand account of his interrogation in a secret CIA prison. Abu Zubaydah is a Saudi-born Palestinian who was seized in a house raid in Faisalabad, Pakistan, on March 28, 2002. In September 2006, he resurfaced in Guantanamo, where President Bush announced that he was one of the 14 high-value detainees previously held in secret CIA prisons. Abu Zubaydah's testimony is included in a report by International Committee for the Red Cross of the treatment of detainees in U.S. custody. You have asked for this office's views on whether certain proposed conduct would violate the prohibition against torture found at Section 2340A of Title 18 of the United States Code. You have asked for this advice in the course of conducting interrogations of Abu Zubaydah. In light of the information you believe Zubaydah has and the high level of threat you believe now exists, you wish to move the interrogations into what you have described as an increased pressure phase. This phase will likely last no more than several days, but could last up to 30 days. And again, this is Abu Zubaydah speaking. About two and a half or three months after I arrived in this place, the interrogation began again, but with more intensity than before. Then the real torturing started. In this phase, you would like to employ 10 techniques that you believe will dislocate his, expe his expectations regarding the treatment he believes he will receive and encourage him to disclose crucial information mentioned above. These 10 techniques are, one, attention grasp, two, walling, three, facial hold, four, facial slap, five, cramped confinement, six, wall standing, seven, stress positions, eight, sleep deprivation, nine, insects placed in a confinement box, and 10, the water board. You have informed us that you, by the way, is, is they're addressing CIA um, operatives who are asking for, for permission. 
You have informed us that you expect these techniques to be used in some sort of escalating fashion, culminating with the waterboard, though not necessarily ending with this technique. Two black wooden boxes were brought into the room outside my cell. One was tall, slightly higher than me, and narrow, measuring perhaps one meter by three quarters of a meter and two meters in height. The other was shorter, perhaps only one meter in height. I was taken out of my cell and one of the interrogators wrapped a towel around my neck. They then used it to swing me around and smash me repeatedly against the hard walls of my room. I was also repeatedly slapped in the face. As I was still shackled, the pushing and pulling around meant that the shackles pulled painfully on my ankles. Cramped confinement involves the placement of the individual in a confined space, the dimensions of which restrict the individual's movement. The confined space is usually dark. The duration of confinement varies based on the size of the container. For the larger confined space, the individual can stand up or sit down. The smaller space is large enough for the subject to sit down. Confinement in the larger space can last up to 18 hours. For the smaller space, confinement lasts no more than two hours. I was then put into the tall box for what I think was about one and a half to two hours. The box was totally black on the inside as well as the outside. It had a bucket inside to use as a toilet and had water to drink provided in a bottle. They put a cloth of cover over the outside of the box to cut out the light and restrict my air supply. It was difficult to breathe. For walling, a flexible false wall will be constructed. The individual is placed with his heels touching the wall. The interrogator pulls the individual forward and then quickly and firmly pushes the individual into the wall. It is the individual's shoulder blades that hit the wall. During this motion, the head and neck are supported with a rolled hood or towel that provides a C-collar effect to help prevent whiplash. To further reduce the probability of injury, the individual is allowed to rebound from the flexible wall. You have orally informed us that the false wall is in part constructed to create a loud sound when the individual hits it which will further shock or surprise the individual. In part, the idea is to create a sound that will make the impact seem far worse than it is and will be far worse than any injury that might result from the action. When I was let out of the box, I saw that one of the walls of the room had been covered with plywood sheeting. From now on, it was against this wall that I was then smashed with the towel around my neck. I think that the plywood was there to provide some absorption of the impact of my body. The interrogators realized that smashing me against the hard wall would probably quickly result in physical injury. During these torture sessions, many guards were present, plus two interrogators who did the actual beating still asking questions, which the main interrogator left to return when the beating was over. After the beating, I was then placed in the small box. They placed a cloth or cover over the box to cut out all light and restrict my air supply. As it was not high enough even to sit upright, I had to crouch down. It was very difficult because of my wounds. The wound on my leg began to open and started to bleed. I don't know how long I remained in the small box. I think I may have slept or maybe fainted. Finally, you would like to use the technique called the waterboard. In this procedure, the individual is bound securely to an inclined bench which is approximately four feet by seven feet. The individual's feet are generally elevated. A cloth is placed over the forehead and eyes. Water is then applied to the cloth in a controlled manner. As this is done, the cloth is lowered until it covers the nose and mouth. Once the cloth is saturated and completely covers the mouth and nose, airflow is slightly restricted for 20 to 40 seconds due to the presence of the cloth. This causes an increase in carbon dioxide level in the individual's blood. This increase in the carbon dioxide level stimulates increased effort to breathe. This effort, puts the, this effort plus the cloth produces the perception of suffocation and incipient panic, 
i.e. the perception of drowning. During those 20 to 40 seconds, water is continuously applied from a height of 12 to 24 inches. After this period, the cloth is lifted and the individual is allowed to breathe unimpeded for three or four full breaths. The sensation of drowning is immediately relieved by the removal of the cloth. The procedure may then be repeated. The water is usually applied from a canteen cup or small watering can with a spout. You have orally informed us that this procedure triggers an automatic physiological sensation of drowning that the individual cannot control even though he may be aware that he is in fact not drowning. You have also orally informed us that it is likely that this procedure would not last more than 20 minutes in any one application. I was then dragged from the small box, unable to walk properly, and put on what looked like a hospital bed and strapped down very tightly with belts. A black cloth was then placed over my face and the interrogators used a mineral water bottle to pour water on the cloth so that I could not breathe. After a few minutes, the cloth was removed and the bed was rotated into an upright position. The pressure of the straps on my wounds was very painful. I vomited. The bed was then again lowered to a horizontal position and the same torture carried out again with the black cloth over my face and water poured on from a bottle. On this occasion, my head was in a more backward, downwards position and the water was poured on for a longer time. I struggled against the straps, hoping, trying to breathe but it was hopeless. I thought I was going to die. I lost control of my urine. Since then, I still lose control of my urine when under stress. In order for pain or suffering to rise to the level of torture, the statute requires that it be severe. Although the confinement boxes, both small and large, are physically uncomfortable because their size restricts movement, they are not so small as to require the individual to contort his body to sit or stand. You also orally informed us that despite his wound, Zubaida remains quite flexible, which would substantially reduce any pain associated with being placed in the box. The facial slap and walling contain precautions to ensure that no pain, even approaching severe pain, results. The slap is delivered with fingers slightly spread, which you have explained to us is designed to be less painful than a closed hand slap. The slap is also delivered to the fleshy part of the face, further reducing any risk of physical damage or serious pain. Likewise, walling involves quickly pulling the person forward and then thrusting him against a flexible wall. You have informed us that the sound of hitting the wall will actually be far worse than any possible injury to the individual. The use of the rolled towel around the neck also reduces the risk of injury. While it may hurt to be pushed against the wall, any pain experienced is not of the intensity associated with serious physical injury. I was then placed again in the tall box. While I was inside the box, loud music was played again and somebody kept banging repeatedly on the box from the outside. I tried to sit down on the floor, but because of the small space, the bucket with urine tipped over and spilt over me. I remained in the box for several hours, maybe overnight. I was then taken out and again, a towel was wrapped around my neck and I was smashed into the wall with the plywood covering and repeatedly slapped in the face by the same two interrogators as before. I was then made to sit on the floor with a black hood over my head until the next session of torture began. As we understand it, when the waterboard is used, the subject's body responds as if the subject were drowning, even though the subject may be well aware that he is in fact not drowning. You have informed us that this procedure does not inflict actual physical harm. Thus, although the subject may experience the fear or panic associated with the feeling of drowning, the waterboard does not inflict physical pain. As we explained in the section 2340A memorandum, pain and suffering, as used in section 2340, is best understood as a single concept, not distinct concepts of pain as distinguished from suffering. 
The waterboard, which inflicts no pain or actual harm whatsoever, does not, in our view, inflict severe pain or suffering. Even if one were to parse the statute more finely to attempt to treat suffering as a distinct concept, the waterboard could not be said to inflict severe suffering. The waterboard is simply a controlled acute episode, lacking the connotation of a protracted period of time generally given to suffering. This went on for approximately one week. During this time, the whole procedure was repeated five times. On each occasion, apart from one, I was suffocated once or twice and was put in the vertical position on the bed in between. On one occasion, the suffocation was repeated three times. I vomited each time I was put in the vertical position between the suffocation. During that week, I was not given any solid food. I was only given and sure to drink. My head and beard were shaved every day. I collapsed and lost consciousness on several occasions. Eventually, the torture was stopped by the intervention of the doctor. I was told during this period that I was one of the first to receive these interrogation techniques, so no rules applied. It felt like they were experimenting and trying out techniques to be used later on other people. You also got a battery, oh. a low battery. In this oh, did I? Okay. All right, while well, I'm fixing that. Um, so what we've heard are excerpts from an official memo um, by two of, of the White House um, counsel attorneys back in 2002. Um, and they are advising CIA interrogators on um, techniques that can be used. And then we heard Abu Zubayda, uh, excerpts from Abu Zubayda's uh, testimony, uh, his personal journal. So. Um, the question I'm going to address is, I'm going to address to you is, does this, in, in what, what was uh, done to Abu Zubaydah, for instance, do you think it um, constitutes state-sponsored torture? And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to ask you to work with a partner. I'm going to give one of these out to each two or three persons. And I'd like you to discuss just, you know, what, what do you think? And if you so, if you feel like talking about this, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask if anybody would like to share their ideas or if they have questions. We'll allow for some time for that. I don't think we'll we have be, enough for everyone. We'll move on. <laughs> it's from the UN Convention Against Torture, which was written in 1984. The United States signed it in 1988. So, um, does anybody want that? me to read this so that you can, in case you can't see it from the back? Does, can everyone see it from the back? Okay. Um, are there any extra copies? Maybe I could pass it to the back yes, if you've had a chance to read it. Here we go. So. The part that I highlighted here is instigation of or with the consent or acquiescence of a public individual or other person acting in an official capacity. And what the document kind of shows is that whatever was done, if you want to consider it torture or not, it certainly was done with the knowledge of, of um, someone at, at the executive uh, level of, of our government. Um, any reactions or what do you think? Do, do you think it constitutes torture or is on the borderline or? Well, yeah. I, I think that counts. Uh, waterboarding as not being suffering is kind of a ridiculous claim to me. Um, and I think the CIA counts as an official capacity. Mm -hmm. So it seems kind of black and white. Black and white? Okay. I think to me personally, like, that definitely counts as severe physical pain, but I guess I can see why, like, if they're looking for a loophole, maybe they can make an argument that it's not, but I don't see how they could say that it wasn't a severe mental suffering mm -hmm. for him, because it clearly was, like, the vomiting and not being able to control the mm -hmm. uh, Abu Zubaydah, by the way, was waterboarded a total of 88 times, which was not 
Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was, was waterboarded, I believe, 188 times. So uh, Abu Zubaydah didn't get quite, quite the same treatment. But Anybody else have a reaction or question? or makes you wonder what severe really is, given the numbers. I mean, we heard of his personal experience with a few times in one week, which have undergone that 88 times. Do you think we have time for the other reading? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, so if it was illegal, well, was, was it illegal? And if it was legal, was it moral? Do, do, do you, is, is there any distinction that you feel should be made? These are just you know questions you can meditate. I, I'm not going to pretend to be unbiased here, but I, I don't want to out now tell you. <laughs> I don't want to tell you what you should think. I, I can't tell you what you should think. I'm not, that would be not right. Um, I'm going to later on after the next reading, uh, we'll be looking at a set of questions that you can answer, and I do think I have more copies of that one. Um, and I just set some guidelines for the discussion, just, you know, speak in I statements and share the time, but I don't see anybody really trying to monopolize the time anyway, so that's fine. And listen and respect different opinions, which is, is fine. Um, so document number two, and I don't think this one is quite as long. This, again, is, is from the same, um, compilation of documents and the list of resources that I'll give you will give you the uh, URL where you can get to this reckoning with torture. Let's see where we are. Okay, here next. Slide eight. Okay. You want me to start off first? Um, yeah, let's see. We will now read excerpts from. Okay, we've got uh, it. Got yeah, it. Thank so you. We'll, we'll, we'll set this We're one up. We're going to read excerpts from the <laughs> interrogation log, detainee 063. This 83 page document, we're not going to read all 83 pages, document <laughs> logs the minute by minute, seven week interrogation of Muhammad Al Qatani, which took place from November 2002 to January 2003 at Camp X ray, uh, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Just to explain, I don't know if you're aware of uh, Guantanamo Camp X-Ray, when you see the pictures of the detainees that look like in the, they're in uh, like pens, chicken coops, that's Camp X-Ray. That they, they really weren't um, prepared for the numbers of, of detainees that were going to be coming. And then a couple of years later, they built uh, a new modern building that is not Camp X-Ray. And I, and it, escapes me the name of it, but the, the um, detainees are no longer, I mean, for a long time, they haven't been kept in those chicken coop things. It is, it is a kind of a modern prison building. Um, it has um, isolation facilities. It also has recreation facilities, things like that. So it's, it's a citadel. It's a huge citadel. If you see pictures of it on the internet, it's no longer the, the chicken coops. Upon entering the booth, lead interrogator played the call to, to call to prayer with a special alarm clock. Detainee was told, this is no longer the call to prayer. You're not allowed to pray. This is the call to interrogation, so pay attention. Both lead and control participated in a pride and ego down approach. Control told detainee, UBL, that's Osama bin Laden. UBL has made a whore of Islam. Since you follow UBL, you also rape Islam. Control put a sign on detainee that had the Arabic word for coward written on it. Explained how the words liar, stupid, weak, and failure apply to detainee. Detainee showed very little emotion during the initial portion of the session, except for the occasional smug smile that was met with immediate taunts and ridicule from the interrogators. 
Lead ordered detainee to go to the bathroom and walk for 20 minutes. Refused water. Corman checked his vital signs and stated he was fine. Both interrogators continued with the futility and pride and ego down approaches. <clears throat> On occasion, when the detainee began to drift off into sleep, Lead dripped a couple of drops of water on detainee's head to keep him awake. Detainee jerked violently in his chair each time. After a bathroom and walking break and detainee's refusal of water, the interrogators continued the aforementioned approaches. Detainee showed little response during this session. Detainee became increasingly tired and incoherent. Detainee received walking and bathroom break, re refused water. He then slept for one hour followed by one hour in his chair listening to white noise. Control showed detainee the banana rats and stated that they live better than he does. Lead asked detainee, what do you think is going to happen to you? What would a judge do if he saw all the information that links you to Al-Qaeda? Detainee, detainee stated, I'm not associated with Al-Qaeda. After that statement, Control read all circumstantial evidence collected against detainee. Detainee attempted to hide his emotions, but was clearly frightened when asked if the judge had enough evidence to convict him. Detainee walked, refused water, and allowed to begin four-hour rest period. Detainee awakened and offered coffee, refused. Detainee taken to bathroom and walked 10 minutes, offered water, refused. Interrogators began telling detainee how ungrateful and grumpy he was. In order to escalate the detainee's emotions, a mask was made from an MRE box with a smiley face on it and placed on the detainee's head for a few moments. A latex glove was inflated and labeled the sissy slap glove. This glove was touched to the detainee's face periodically after explaining the terminology to him. The mask was placed back on the detainee's head. While wearing the mask, the team began dance instruction with the deta detainee. The detainee became agitated and began shouting. The mask was removed and detainee was allowed to sit. Detainee shouted and addressed Lead as the oldest Christian here and wanted to know why Lead allowed the detainee to be treated this way. Detainee taken to bathroom and walked 10 minutes. Detainee offered food and water, refused. Detainee was unresponsive for remainder of session. Afghanistan Taliban themes run for remainder of session. I think we should mention that several hours have gone by during the course of this transcript. Detainee taken to bathroom and walked 10 minutes. Detainee offered water, refused. Corman changed bandages on ankles, checked vitals, okay. Detainee taken to bathroom and walked 10 minutes. Corman checks vitals and starts IV. Detainee given three bags of IV. Detainee taken to bathroom and walked 10 minutes. Detainee was unresponsive. Detainee was allowed to sleep. Detainee was awakened by interrogation team. He was offered food and water, but he refused. Nine hours later, the interrogation team and detainee watched the video, Operation Enduring Freedom. Two hours later, detainee was sent to the latrine, offered water, but he refused. 2,200 hours, detainee exercised for good health and circulation. Medical representative took detainee's vital signs and removed the IV housing unit from the detainee's arm. The detainee's pulse rate was low, 38, and his blood pressure was high, 144 over 90, Detainee complained of having a boil on his left leg just below his knee. The medical representative looked at the leg and phoned the doctor. The doctor instructed the corpsman to recheck the detainee's vitals in one hour. One hour later, detainee refused water and food. He was taken to the latrine and exercised in order to assist in improving detainee's vital signs. The medical representative rechecked the detainee's vital signs almost a full 24 hours later. The detainee's blood pressure had improved, but it was still high, 138 over 80, and his pulse rate had improved, but it remained low, 42. The corpsman called the doctor to provide an update, and the doctor said operations could continue since there had been no significant change. It was noted that historically, the detainee's pulse sometimes drops into, into the 40s in the evenings. 
so in case you're wondering what happened um, to Al, Al Qahtani, uh, he was a Saudi Arabian citizen that was brought to Guantanamo in early 2002. His treatment included, but was not limited to, severe sleep deprivation uh, combined with 20 hour per day interrogations continuing for months at a time. He was put in prolonged and solitary, solitary confinement, including severe isolation for several months prior to November 23rd, 2002. He also was subjected to um, religious and sexual hu humiliation, including strip surgery, uh, strip searching, and forced nudity in the presence of female personnel, and being forced to wear a bra and a woman's thumb on his head. Finally, uh, he was there in 2002. He was finally charged six years later, February 28th, with involvement in the 9-11 attacks. However, all charges were dismissed uh, May 28th by Susan Crawford, the convening authority for the military commissions. And in January of 2009, um, Susan Crawford admitted that she withdrew the charges because of clear evidence of, of torture at one time. And as of January 22nd, just a couple days ago when I put this together, al Qatani has been held at Guantanamo, so he has no charges pending against him, but he's still being held. He's been held for nine years and 11 months. So again, I'm gonna ask you to um, choose a partner, and um, if you think, that, you may think that Guantanamo, we were talking about 2002, 2008, this is, 2000, this is 2012, so what's currently going on? So I have a little questionnaire that you and a partner can work on uh, to, to um, see what's going on right now with the war on terror. If anybody yes, needs I pens, I got, I got pens here. Mm -hmm. Those are the two groups. Mm -hmm. You can form two groups in this. About two groups in this row as well. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. I have an extra one if you need another one. Here's an extra in case that's not there.
Mm -hmm. oh, How many are still working? You raise your hand, still working? Okay, I'll give you a couple more, a couple more minutes. We're actually doing pretty good on time. I have, I have a short video, we have a short video clip um, we're going to show next. Take it. You don't have to just listen to us on the touch. Okay, so here's the answer key. So the, the answers are, are in bold, actually. <laughs> The questions and answers, by the way, come from two different sources. Um, the ACLU has um, the ACLU has a website up called Guantanamo by the Numbers and Human Rights Watch. Also has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The question says um, how many would have gone to have been associated with Al Qaeda? Yeah. Do they exclusively um, detain you know, people that are finger with Al Qaeda, or do they get people from other terrorist groups as well? Okay, so right. So, are you aware how how the detainees were arrested? How they got to Guantanamo? Nope. Okay, so what happened was, um, after we began to um, bomb and, and we went in to invade um, uh, Afghanistan, because of course Afghanistan had harbored Osama bin Laden and, and was being controlled by the Taliban, um, so this was late in 2001. Um, so, um, we were working with a group called the Northern Alliance. So we were working with a group of Afghan fighters who were against the Taliban and were trying to get the Taliban out of their country. We did a lot of, of um, uh, operations. One of our operations, we actually, and you can find this on the web, we actually dropped um, leaflets promising people um, $5,000, I believe it was $5,000, several thousand dollars anyway, if they would turn over anybody they knew to be a terrorist or associated with um, Osama bin Laden. So what happened was people in villages, um, this, this money was a big incentive. And um, they began to just turn over foreigners, I mean anybody that nobody could speak for them. There, there is a lot of, you know, there are a lot of transient people. There's people that, that have come. If you, if you read um, the, uh, uh, the Guantanamo files by um, Andy Worthington and other files that are available, you see that a lot of the people that were picked up were in Afghanistan. Some of them had come from a pilgrimage or a pilgrimage. Other people had come to study Islam. Um, some people had come just because they, they came from Libya or somewhere where they couldn't find a job and they came and they, they settled and found a job. These people were picked up. They were picked up by the Northern Alliance. And then they were, there were no criteria. Um, the Northern Alliance did not screen these people. And then they were handed over to the Americans. So um, there's a question here about how many of them were actually arrested by uh, by United States, or percentage, yeah, number seven, what percentage of Guantanamo detainees were found never to have been Al-Qaeda fighters? No, that's 5%. I may not have used this one. Um, but very, very few of the detainees were actually arrested by United States personnel. Most of them were swept up by Northern Alliance fighters after the Northern Alliance um, secured a victory with, with, our, um, with our assistance in 2002. And then they were just pushed over and given to um, American forces. Most of them were held at Bagram, which is still a prison there in, in Afghanistan. They were, they were held at Bagram for a while, and then they were transferred to, um, to Guantanamo. Okay, so 
Yeah, I mean, they were looking for people who they thought could uh, lead them to uh, to Osama bin Laden. Yeah. Um, so for number six, it says it costs seventy million per person. Yeah. Being held. And right. Then number two, it says it's one hundred and seventy-one currently there. So it's currently costing seventy million times one hundred and seventy. According to the ACLU, yes. Do you know? That's you know probably. The breakdown is in the seventy million. Mm, I don't. It's probably because it's such a huge facility. Uh, that would be my guess, but I, I, I really couldn't claim to, to know that. Um, there's also a lot of personnel there that have to be uh, paid or taken care of. There's a lot of new construction. Yeah. They also um, built, it, it's actually in the Inquire uh, several years ago. Um, there's a totally modern kind of courtroom that they built there, um, complete with air conditioning. Um, this is Cuba, it's hot there. So they, they actually built a new modern um, uh, court there to hold the military commissions. And I believe it has, you know, it has uh, tele, uh, tele viewing features and broadcast features and things like that. So they really spared no expense in, in, in building the facility. And 171 people are there right now. You'll notice um, some of them are actually, you know, have they've, they've been cleared. Um, they actually have no no charges pending against them. They are either from a country that we know to be a country that tortures, and so we don't want to send them back to their homeland. That was their original place that they came from, even though they, they were picked up in Afghanistan. Um, in some cases, the, we have looked for other places. Um, we have sent Uyghurs, um, which is a, a group of Chinese uh, Muslims. Um, we've sent them to the island, some of them to the island of Pulau. Um, some of the uh, released detainees have been sent to Albania. Um, others have been sent to the Republic of Georgia, formerly part of the USSR. So in some cases, we're able to find a third party country to take them. Part of the problem with this is there's still more Uyghurs, still more of the, um, the Chinese Muslims. They are considered terrorists, according to China. And so a third party country that would take them is at risk for damaging its relations, its uh, political relations with China. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work, it's really a lot of diplomatic work has to go into finding a place. Um, the Uyghurs were actually ordered by a federal judge to be released into the United States. And there are two Uyghur communities ready to take them. I know one is in Florida. I forget the state that the other one is, is in. But there was just too much of a hue and cry of releasing them into the United States. We don't want to release any of these people, even though they're cleared. They, they're branded. Um, we don't want to release them into the United States. Any other questions that I probably can't answer or reactions? Okay, I'm gonna, um, we're gonna show a little clip. This is from um, an organization called the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. And um, they are based in Washington, D.C. Um, they are an interfaith organization. And actually, um, they are a coalition of churches and faith traditions. So individuals don't, don't join, organizational churches um, join. And um, this is a little clip from, uh, from their uh, video, which is called Repairing the Brokenness. And you'll see um, uh, speakers from various faith traditions. The first speaker that you see is Dr. George Hunsinger. He is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church, and he also teaches ethics at Princeton um, Theological Seminary in Princeton, New Jersey. And he is actually the founder of the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. You're holding people accountable for wrongdoing means that uh, they may have to suffer the consequences in, in certain ways. And, and it's partly uh, <clears throat> as a matter of deterrence and, and creating uh, 
a logic of incentives so that people will not uh, continue to engage in wrongdoing uh, and that they will have the example before them of somebody who was prosecuted and, and sent to, to prison. But if there are no consequences, and if accountability isn't worked out in that way, then uh, it's of moral certainty that the practices will continue. After 9-11, the Bush administration, through Vice President Cheney, told the American people that we were going to have to go to the dark side in order to respond to the terrorists. Little did we know that the dark side included the use of torture. Torture has been illegal in the United States for decades. It is, has been illegal internationally, and it is morally corrupt, and it corrupts the soul of our country. But that is what the Bush administration decided to use as an interrogation technique. One of the uh, systems that they used was a, a system called waterboarding, where you make a person believe that they're drowning. And we used it repeatedly on a number of the detainees. And it's a technique that has been deemed torture going back as far as the Spanish Inquisition. We used shackling in stress positions, which put people hanging in with their hands above their heads in cold rooms naked for hours and maybe days. You know, right now in America, there are thousands of veterans of, the, of recent wars, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Many of them are dealing with the trauma of having committed violence, of having not only committed violence that was sanctioned, but in the context of that war, having done things that they themselves are ashamed of. You know, and these are, you know, when you look at that hurt, when you look at that pain, when you look at the kind of addictions and depression that many of our veterans have, um, and when they talk about about what they did, about how much of, of their illness, their sickness, their spiritual sickness comes from bad actions they did, then we wonder what is the deeper effect of something like torture that is premeditated, deliberate, uh, persistent, consistent. What is happening to all of those people who witnessed that, who, who were involved in that, and how does that affect their families and their neighbors and, and the rest of society? So the ramifications of something that is so evil um, are never limited. You know, to the to the small dark rooms where these things are occurred. Quite frankly, we as a nation need to repent of this. And repentance is confessing it. And part of confessing in it is owning up to it. Jewish tradition believes that every human being was created in God's image, and so it's a desecration of God's image to torture them. And it's part of our American values as well that everyone has infinite worth. The fact that we torture people as a nation means we've lost our moral standing on those issues. We've said, we've denied that sacredness in every human being, and I think it's created a real generation of moral failing. I think kids today think that it's okay to torture somebody else, that that's actually what heroes do to keep ourselves safe. But we've lost our own values. We've lost the moral compass. People say to me, well, Al-Qaeda is willing to torture people. Shouldn't we be willing to do the same? And I think it says something tremendously horrible about us as a nation if Al-Qaeda is guiding the moral conversation. Still Americans feel insecure after 9-11. We're concerned about our safety. And there's a fear that by, by investigating um, these events that we somehow are going to make ourselves more vulnerable to more criticism, more vulnerable to our enemies who will use this information to um, to attack us. Uh, but what people have to understand is this information is already widely available. Um, we may not see much of it in the US news, in the newspapers, and, and on TV here, but it is widely available in the rest of the world. There are many graphic photos that Americans haven't seen that people in Egypt and Pakistan and, and other places have seen. So there's no hiding this. There also has to be a national confession. And quite frankly, if the United States doesn't repent of its sin of torture, of doing this to people, abusing them, treating them as objects, then I think our collective national soul will suffer.
The National Religious Campaign Against Torture has issued a statement calling for a commission of inquiry in order to address the issue of accountability with respect deliberate. That's actually a lot. Um, I'll show you from there. Um, the entire um, the entire video is, is available online and I have a link to it uh, besides two other videos that the National Religious Campaign Against Torture has um, has has made. So the question I'd like to leave you with and we can. We have time if we want to talk about it a little bit too. The, the question is: um, President Obama has been quoted as saying that it's time to just move on. Um, that we should not prosecute people like Jay Bybee. Uh, John Yu is teaching law. <coughs> I, I don't know if you find that as uh, as stunning as I do. Um, that that this person who guided the CIA in um, methods of inter enhanced interrogation techniques, um, which, to be honest, I consider to be torture. He is teaching law to, to, young, to young upcoming lawyers. Um, President Obama does not want to be seen as wreaking vengeance. He doesn't want to make it look like a political thing where the Democrats are wreaking vengeance on the Republicans, and certainly, I'm, I'm sensitive to that, but as Dr. Hunsinger said, um, other countries look at what has been done, and they know, believe me, they are in the know. Um, this, this information is, is uh, published there, and um, as Dr. Matson said on the, on the video, they have seen even more horrific uh, photos. There's a whole second series of Abu Ghraib photos which were not made public. Um, if we who try, if the United States which tries to champion human rights and tries to call China out, for instance, for its human rights abuses, does not come to terms um, with human rights that we have um, perpetrated and no one is held accountable, then what does that say? What does that say for us uh, on a political level and our standing in, in the world. Uh, at one of the Republican debates, a few debates back, um, Senator Huntsman, who has, has since dropped out of the, um, the race for the Republican candidacy, he pointed that out. Uh, first of all, Dr. Um, uh, uh, Ron Paul was, was the only, he and, and Dr. he and Huntsman were the only two of the, ca of the uh, candidate hopefuls at the time who even said that torture was not a good thing. Ron Paul came out and said torture is uncivilized, and felt that it should not be done. And um, Huntsman, Senator Huntsman backed him up on that and pointed out that people do still look to the United States. They, they look to us um, as an example. And if we can't admit what we did and um, uh, you know have some kind of, of uh, of uh, accountability, what's that say? And that's just on a political human rights level. Of course, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture is addressing itself to people of faith, which you may or not may not be, that's fine. Um, but if you're a person of faith, what does that say? And they, they, very, they make the point very well that all religions, they, they uh, interviewed a rabbi, uh, someone from Islam, and someone from an evangelical, uh, Protestant organization, um, as well as Do Dr. Hunsinger himself, who is a minister, there's that common belief that we are all made in the image of God. And uh, how do you torture somebody uh, for the sake of what, what you say you're going to, the information that you're going to get out of them? So that's kind of the bigger question, the question um, for people of faith. And um, just uh, uh, the one thing I, I also like to mention is if you're talking with anybody or reading, occasionally there are things in the paper. There are two big arguments against torture. There is the utilitarian argument, which says torture does not work. And there are former uh, interrogators, such as Matthew Alexander, who will talk about how all these uh, brutal techniques get you nothing. He has been an FBI uh, 
the interrogator and, and knows about the humane techniques and knows that they work much better. As a matter of fact, the FBI, and you can, these records are all on the internet as well through the Freedom Information Act. The FBI was at uh, Guantanamo and was starting to interrogate people and then the CIA came in with totally different techniques and the FBI um, agents were absolutely horrified and you can read their complaints, what they saw. Uh, they saw people being shackled to the ground, left for days in their own excrement. Um, they, they saw the, the people, um, the detainees, uh, who were um, exposed to cold, uh, doused with water and then left in a cold room. Is that a valid, is that, these are interrogation techniques, one would we'll have to ask. So there's the utilitarian argument, and there are people who argue that if you really want to convince the American people not to torture, you have to tell them it's, it doesn't work. Okay. Of course, for people of faith, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, for instance, the main argument is, is the moral and theological one, that you do not harm someone else uh, made in the image of God. And that's, that's foremost for them. So there are two kinds of arguments. And you may hear one, you may hear the other. You may hear a combination of both. And um, some will, you know, there, there are going to be people that say, you know, when it comes to Al-Qaeda and the horror of 9-11, it was just abominable. It was a terrible thing. I've met people. I've spoken with people who um, helped do the cleanup. And, and, you know, it's just a horrible uh, thing that they went through. Um, you know, some people will say, hey, when it comes to our country and our security, the morals are going to go out the window. You got to tell people it doesn't work. That's what's really going to work. And you know, we're on, as others will hold up, you know, the, the more of the, the moral or the, um, the theological argument. So just just to let you know. And, and if you get books on torture, sometimes some of these combine a little of both. Some some of them emphasize one over the other. So we've been talking a lot. Any any anybody else have any? Um, I'd like to share anything with the, with the rest of the group or have questions or anything? Oh, we have a final word from a Guantanamo detainee named Juma Aldosari. And uh, there's a book out called Poems from Guantanamo. These poems were smuggled out by an attorney who was um, pro bono representing a couple of the detainees. Uh, again, the author is Juma Aldosari. The title of the poem is Death Poem. Take my blood, take my death shroud and the remnants of my body, take photographs of my corpse at the grave, lonely, send them to the world, to the judges, and to the people of conscience. Send them to the principal of men and the fair-minded and let them bear the guilty burden before the world of this innocent soul. Let them bear the burden before their children and before history of this wasted, sinless soul, of this soul which has suffered at the hands of the protectors of peace. Juma al you'll be glad to know, um, was released. Um, he was born, he's a Bahraini, he's a Bahraini Saudi national. He attempted suicide 14 times in Guantanamo, and he was um, uh, subjected to particularly brutal, uh, brutal abuse. Um, another point that um, uh, National Religious Campaign Against Torture and others will make is that another reason for prosecution is that so things are not just resting on this president or that's president, that president's executive order. In other words, if there's another attack, could, could this whole syndrome start up again? And that's really what we're faced with. Um, you might be aware that President Obama, on his first day in office, signed an executive order saying that um, Guantanamo would be closed within a year. It's 2012, and Guantanamo is still open. Granted, he got a lot of opposition. Um, a lot of obstacles were put in his way. Um, if you feel so led, you can take um, this guide, which will help you. You can actually go to the website and, um, if you want, send a petition to Obama to, to work a little harder and get Guantanamo closed. Um, there is a British national among the 179 detainees named Shakar Amer, 
and Amnesty International um, is circulating a petition for his release. If you would like to, if, again, if you like to take it, there's either there's a model letter you can send or put it on a postcard, or there's the website you could go to and send it electronically. And this is um, a petition, if you feel like signing it, um, this is from the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, calling for um, a full and complete and impartial investigation. If you feel so led. And, um, and anything else that anybody else would, would like to say, share, ask? Um, there's also, um, oh, take a list of resources, and it also has my contact information and Louise's. If you um, have questions later on, if you have to write this up for class and, and you want some answers, have some uh, additional information, feel free to contact me. We can so take find these books uh, yes. either in the library or through Easy Borrow. We actually, library yeah, we actually and there's some online resources as well. Yeah. Thanks for coming.